Hello, I'm Adrian Davey from Pure Electrical Training and welcome to part one of this video where we discuss resistors in series. First, I will try to help you understand where resistors in series comes into your career as an electrician so that you can better stand a chance at remembering the content and can then also be able to apply it on site. By the end of this lesson, you must know that resistances in a series circuit add up to equal the resistance total, or RT, for example, R1 plus R2 plus R3 equals resistance total. You should know that the reason we are learning about resistors in series is because it relates to the resistances within an electrical installation, like testing radial circuits, for example, which I will demonstrate in this video. Some of you could understand how we measure those resistances using test method one and test method two, and hopefully you will start to understand the difference which will aid you in your career. I will also show you where to record the highest readings on the BS7671 model forms. In the second part of this video, we will be discussing series circuits drawn out in diagrams like this. But in order for you to stand the best chance of remembering this knowledge, you need to understand what it all actually means and how it ties into your career as an electrician. Which is why, in this first video, I talk about testing electrical circuits at work and in the practical classroom, because in the first year, you really want to be tying the knowledge between the theory and the practical so that you can start to develop your understanding of inspection and testing in preparation for the third year. You cannot rush this process as it takes time, but if we sow the seeds on inspection and testing now, then you build up this knowledge in the workplace over the next two to three years. First then, a quick reminder that all of our resistances in a series circuit add up to equal to resistance total, because series resistance is proportional to length. So if you think about a radial circuit, for example, what that means is that as you add length to the circuit, you are also adding in resistance. You will also notice that there are numbers and letters which are smaller, and we refer to those as subscripts, and these help to identify certain parts within a formula, and in this case, individual resistances. For now, we will call resistance total the RT for short. Later on, we will call the highest recorded resistance of the circuit protected conductor R2 instead, which can cause confusion. So just put that thought to one side for now. Consider a radial circuit. While you are testing the circuit and proving continuity of your CPC, if you recorded the individual resistances between each socket, you could add them all up to calculate your resistance total. Let's say that our first resistance reading between the fuse board and the first socket was 0.3 ohms. The resistance between socket one and socket two was 0.05 ohms. Between socket three and socket two was 0.07 ohms. And finally, the resistance between socket three and socket four was 0.15 ohms. Combined, those individual resistances would add up to 0.30 ohms. And if you were to test from the start of the circuit to the end of the circuit, then that total resistance would be represented on the low ohm resistance tester as represented here. When you are testing the resistance of one conductor only, we call that test method two. And this test also proves that the circuit is continuous, which is why it is called continuity. During your career, we will call the highest resistance of test method two on the CPC, the R2. And if you are completing an electrical installation certificate, then you would record that value in the box marked R2, which is shown here. However, if you only test R2 on a circuit, then you may not be able to tick the polarity box unless, for example, you have seen all the conductors throughout their length. If we did the same for the line conductor, the total resistance for that circuit would be called R1. And when combined with the previous R2 value, will become the R1, R2 value that you will often hear people referring to. To test R1 and R2 together for ease and to save time, we connect the two conductors together into a connector block at the supply end of the cable and then test between R1 and R2 at each point operating the switches on accessories as we go to prove functional switching and moving downstream in the circuit until we find the highest resistance. This may or may not be the furthest point because we should never assume for obvious reasons, like a faulty socket, for example. Just to be clear, when you are testing one conductor like the CPC, that is called test method two, but when you are testing two conductors like your line and CPC together, that is called test method one. 
Pretty confusing, don't you think? Surely the IET would have identified those test methods the other way around to make it easier to remember. It would make more sense that testing one conductor would be test method one and testing two conductors would be test method two. Much easier. But for now, this is what we are stuck with and you will have to do your best to remember that they are the opposite way round. With test method one, as we move through the circuit, the loop from the connector block gets bigger and as such, the resistance increases. Each point tested downstream of the supply increases the distance the electrons have to flow and the resistance increases proportional to the length. Finally, when we get to the last socket, this will be our longest distance and theoretically our highest resistance. Some of the things that can affect that resistance reading are the tightness of the terminal connections onto the copper conductors, biting down on the insulation rather than the conductor, or a faulty worn socket, and then you will be identifying the fault by fault finding, all of which could be at any point within the circuit, so don't just assume that your furthest point will yield the highest reading, as many people often make that mistake. When it comes to recording the reading, you would record the highest value in the box to the left of the previous one, which is shown here. You only need to record either R1 plus R2 or R2, not both. But don't forget that if you only test R2, you still need to test your R1 if you are calculating your maximum measured ZS or helping to prove polarity on circuits. And the easiest way on most circuits is to use test method 1, your R1 plus R2 method. In my inspection testing series, we'll be talking more about the earth fault path and what that actually means. One of the things I cannot stress enough is the need to ensure that your maximum measured ZS has a sufficiently low resistance to ensure that enough current is available to operate the overcurrent protective device within the required time, essentially before the insulation around the conductors loses its integrity. This is achieved by measuring your impedance, the resistance externally, which we call the ZE, and is measured in ohms. This is carried out as a live test because you are not able to isolate the supply from the transformer. This is then added to your R1 plus R2 resistance readings that we were just discussing and becomes your maximum measured ZS. This complete resistance is your measured earth fault loop impedance and needs to be lower than the maximum earth fault loop impedance given in BS7671. The maximum ZS for BS60898 and 61009 supplying circuits other than distribution circuits are referenced in table 41.3 and essentially it all comes back to Ohm's law, like most things that we do. C-min is the minimum supply voltage in the UK, which is our worst case scenario and is 5% of 230 volts, which gives us a value of 218.5 volts to reference against. IA is the current that causes operation of the protective device within the specified time and is linked to the rating of the protective device, either five times the rated current for a type B MCB or RCBO, 10 times for a type C and 20 times for a type D, which gives you the IA for that protective device. This is why you need to understand that current in a series circuit stays the same as we need that fault current to be maintained throughout the circuit in order for the protective device to operate. D min divided by IA gives you the maximum circuit resistance which we call the maximum permitted ZS. This is the path the current takes from the local supply transformer all the way through to the furthest point in the circuit and then during an earth fault condition all the way back to the local transformer via the earthing system. Because the CPC is often smaller than the neutral conductor and has such a higher resistance, it is assumed that if the earth fault path complies with BS7671, then the short circuit fault path also complies. Personally, I do not agree with assuming that R1 plus RN on radial circuits complies just because the R1 plus R2 did. We all know what they say about assumption, and if you do not test R1 plus RN on every circuit, then how would you prove beyond all reasonable doubt that there was no fault on the neutral conductor? I've heard many reasons why, but apparently, and I don't know how true this is, but the logic behind not doing the test is that people already complain about how much testing is required and simply won't do the test. Or the worst thing that can happen is that the appliances just won't work, which we all know just isn't true. 
Let's consider a termination which is clamped down on the insulation, but there is just enough contact to allow the current to flow. The socket is used to power a high powered appliance like an EV charger that makes use of the current available. Not only could this high resistance on the neutral cause heat damage to the cable or the accessory, but it could also cause you to exceed your maximum short circuit impedance, which should be the same or lower than your max ZS in table 41.3 in BS7671. So what does all this have to do with resistance in a series circuit? Well, ultimately, current in a series circuit stays the same. Here is the previous circuit diagram where the R1 plus R2 complied for a type of B 16 amp MCB or RCBO as your max ZS is 2.73 ohms and your MFT is displaying a value well below that. Even when we add on the ZE of 0.35 ohms, your maximum measured ZS is 1.15 ohms for this circuit. Don't forget that the maximum measured ZS for that circuit needs to be lower than 80% of the max ZS from table 41.3 in VS7671. And these figures can be found in either the on-site guide or by calculation. 2.73 ohms times 0.8 gives us a value of 1.1 ohms. And as long as that is equal to or higher than the value recorded on your MFT, then the circuit complies. If the value displayed on your MFT is higher than the 80% value, then you are fault finding and need to find a way to get this value lower or you change the overcurrent protective device and make it a lower value. However, the untested neutral has a high resistance which doesn't meet that value. Once the ZE of 0.35 is added onto the 2.72 ohms measured by the MFT, we get a total circuit resistance of 3.07 ohms, which far exceeds the maximum 2.73 ohms required to operate the circuit protected device in the required time. This is because the maximum current that can now flow is only 71.17 amps, and we needed a current total of 80 amps. In fact, looking in BS7671, Appendix 3, at the time current characteristics of overcurrent protective devices, figure 3A4 gives the characteristics for MCBs and RCBOs. We can now see that if we plot a line from around 70 amps, it will now take around 15 seconds to operate the protective device. That is three times longer than it should be. So as you can see, it does not actually make sense to avoid carrying out R1 plus RN testing on radial circuits. But please consider this as you continue with your career as an electrician, because you can make a difference within the industry. There is a well-known saying amongst electricians who try hard to be the best they can be, and that is to work from BS7671 and not to it. Essentially, BS7671 is the minimum safe standard in the UK. It is not best practice. You can choose whether you want to work to the minimum safe standard as set out by the IET, or you can set your own level that you are happy with. And I'm a great believer of you reap what you sow. I personally wouldn't want to be responsible for a house fire that could kill the people living within the property. And don't forget, if we raise the level of competency in the electrical industry, then everyone wins and wages go up, not down. If you want to see more of my inspection and testing series where I talk you through the basics, then please click the link in the corner of the screen now. Hopefully now then, you can understand why resistors in series are relevant to being an electrician and why it's important that you understand this as you work your way to proving that electrical circuits work correctly using basic Ohm's law. Here is a quick recap of the learning outcomes for this video. You must know the resistances in a series circuit add up to equal the RT. You should know that adding resistances up in a series circuit can be linked to testing radial circuits in an electrical installation. And some of you could know the difference between test method one and test method two. If not, here is a quick reminder. Testing one conductor is test method two and testing two conductors is test method one. Well, that's it for this video. In the next one, I will start going through some series circuits with you and showing you how to calculate your missing values for your science and principles exams. Don't forget that this video can count towards your off the job training for your apprenticeship or just for your own CPD. And please ensure that you like, share and subscribe so that everyone can benefit from this content. Thank you and take care.